Well, good morning and welcome to Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage. Uh, one thing, we're not at the cottage today. We are streaming on uh, our side of the mountain in uh, beautiful downtown Choice Story, Georgia. And so we're, we're glad to have you. Thanks, my many, many thanks to our, our Jesus and Jeans team for trying to help us get everything together. Um, it's been uh, been a an interesting week, and uh, but here we are. We're we we are in the the third weekend of the new year, and uh, literally the weather outside is frightful, and but the snow, at least what little we have, uh, is uh, is really delightful, and uh, we we. Actually, just we're having more wind and rain uh, on this side of the mountain than uh, than snow. But hopefully, we'll try to get some uh, later on today. But uh, <clears throat> I hope that wherever you are this morning, that that you're safe, that you're sound, and 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 most of all, that you're healthy. You know, generally speaking, this time of year is a is a time when we're usually refreshed and reinvigorated and ready to go but but this year is already starting out different in in many ways and not so different at least for me and in, in other ways for example I, I started out this year the very same way I did last year as my birthday rolled around uh, again this past Saturday yesterday I turned 70 and I actually received the very same present that I got last year, COVID-19. Except this year, I'm, I'm just calling it COVID 2.0. And, and this past week, as Jan and I quarantined, I, I started thinking about our, our scripture today. And, and I truly believe that the Holy Spirit inspired me to keep revisiting this familiar passage because he knows that we all could use some encouragement. Before we get started, I want to pray for us this morning. We have our, our usual list of, of prayer requests. Uh, several of the one that, uh, that we want to lift up this morning are usual Sid Penner as he continues to battle pancreatic cancer and is doing well with the treatment. Our, our kids, uh, Ollie and Aiden, uh, have childhood uh, leukemia and cancer and so uh, want to continue to lift them up on a regular basis uh, we have uh, some friends that are up in uh, Banner Elk uh, this morning that have uh, uh, one lady by the name of Lynn who uh, just found out that she has colon cancer and and so they're friends of, of Joe and Ingrid and so we want to lift up Lynn this morning uh, also, I uh, want to pray for uh, Pauletta Johnson's mom, uh, Connie, and um, she was in the hospital and I, I think came down with COVID, and so we want to lift them up and continue to pray for uh, my, my hometown friends, Belinda Jenkins, who is uh, continually going in for treatment and um, said that right now, I just got a, saw an update this morning that she's having a little trouble speaking and words coming to her and uh, so uh, Belinda Jenkins and uh, another good friend Danny Kingsmore and if you'll just keep those two in, in your prayers as well um, Scott Hancock um, uh, Dick Malcolm uh, friends of the Mathers and, and so uh, just trying to, to remember off the top of my head uh, some of the people that we pray for on a regular basis so let's go to the Father in prayer, and then we're going to get into this message. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that you are continually in our lives, that we can come before you, lift up all of our prayer requests, crawl up in your lap and spend time with you that allow you to love on us as you do in such a great and mighty way. We pray for every single prayer request that we've lifted up, and and again, as I say each week, we pray believing, trusting, God, that you're already intervening in each situation. 
We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for loving us. We pray your blessings. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our homes, fill wherever we are, fill our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out that we might be better prepared to engage the world around us, that they might see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. We pray these blessings in the most powerful name, that of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. I can almost hear you say that. You know, our scripture this morning is a very familiar one. It's the, the 23rd Psalm. And, and there's a reason why Psalm 23 is one of the best known and best loved chapters in the Bible. Because God has used this psalm to encourage his people for more than 3,000 years. And my hope and prayer uh, for this message is that God will use these familiar words to bring fresh strength and hope and comfort and encouragement for all of us uh, in 2022. You know, Psalm 23 is about what God does for his people. And like all of the Bible, it points us to Jesus Christ. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus said in John 10, 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. You know, it's a, it's a marvelous thing to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And so this morning, I want to share with you six attributes of the shepherd pictured in David's beloved psalm. And our, our message uh, this morning is entitled, life with the shepherd. And so the first attribute that I want to share with you this morning of the shepherd is this. The shepherd personally owns us. David again said, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. In Psalm 103, it says this. He says, you know the Lord is God. He created us and we belong to him. We are his people and the sheep in his pasture. You know, sheep are, are added to a flock either by being bought or being born. A shepherd can breed sheep or he can buy them. In farming, in sheep farming, one or the other of these is true. A lamb is added to the flock because it's either bought or because it's born. In God's flock, both are true. Every Christ follower has been bought into God's flock. And every Christ follower has been born into God's flock. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. 1 Peter 1.18 says, You were ransomed for the feudal, from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. Now, if you get nothing else out of this message, I hope that you realize and are able to see what the Lord has done for each one of you. He bought you. He paid a price to make you his own. You know, one of the features uh, of the farming year uh, for sheep farmers in Scotland are the sheep auctions. And farmers will buy rams or tups, as they're called, for breeding. Or they'll buy ewes to grow the flock. And before the auction, the farmers walk around the pens and they look at the sheep and they decide which ones that they want to buy and how much they want to bid. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ purchased you 
and the price he paid was the laying down of his own life. You are not your own, the scripture says. You have been bought with a price. And the Lord is now your shepherd. And that is why you will not want. What you need, what we all need, will be given to us because the shepherd has made us his own. His own. Romans 8.32 Having give, given himself to purchase you, you can be sure that he will give you all that you need. You have been bought into Christ's flock, and you have been born into his flock. For sheep, it would, it would be one or the other, but both are true of you. It's a, it's a marvelous thing to be wholly owned by the Son of God. For all your doubts and fears, for all of your unanswered questions, for all the, the many sins and failings that we all struggle with, the truth is, is that Christ loves you. And the Lord is still your shepherd. The relationship of a shepherd to the sheep is first and foremost one of ownership. And the shepherd owns the flock. He bought them and he birthed them. And having bought and bred the flock, the shepherd lives with his sheep. And they are the constant focus of his care and attention. When you belong to the flock of God, you can say with confidence, The Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want. When the Lord is your shepherd, you, you have all that you need. Here's a, a great little poem I found. It says, The king of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Isn't that a great little poem? The king of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. The second attribute that I want to talk about this morning is that the shepherd purposely leads us. He personally owns us, but he also purposely leads us. Verse 2 of the 23rd Psalm said, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You see, green pastures provide grazing for the sheep. But the main point here is not the feeding of the sheep, but the resting of the sheep. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And so the main theme is rest. Then David says, he leads me beside still waters. See, sheep are scared of moving water. And if a sheep should fall in, its, its fleece would, would soak up water like a sponge. And the weight would cause it to drown. And so a good shepherd will dam up a river and make a, a place where the water is still so that the sheep can drink. Here are two beautiful uh, descriptions of rest I want to share with you. The, the, this meadow with lush grass with pools of still water beside it. And there's, there's three, three observations on rest that I want to share with you. Number one, rest does not come easily or naturally to sheep. You know, why, why is it so difficult for sheep to rest? Well. Sheep are timid creatures, they, and the only way that they can defend themselves is to run. And so they remain standing most of the time, and it only takes the bark of a dog, and man, they're off running. 
So how can sheep lie down when they're so vulnerable? Maybe sometimes you find it hard to rest. There's a, a problem that you need to solve. There's an overwhelming challenge that you face. You battle many, many fears and your mind will not rest. You ask, how am I going to, to get through all of this? And a lot of times you lie awake at night and you're going over all that has happened all day long and all that could happen. And you need rest, but you don't know how to find it. You know, David had definitely been there. It, it's clear from this psalm that rest did not come easily or naturally to him either. When, when you think about his life, that's, that's hardly surprising. I mean, all those years of being on the run from King Saul, the, the years of worry over his divided and dysfunctional family, the, the sheer weight of responsibility that he carried on his shoulders as the king. Now, rest did not come easily or naturally to David. But he says, the Lord makes me lie down. Another aspect of rest is that sheep rest when they can see their shepherd. Sheep will only lie down when they feel safe. And they will only feel safe when they can see the shepherd. Put yourself in, in the position of a, of, of a sheep. You know that you, know that you are, are vulnerable. And, and your only defense is to run. So you, you stay on your feet all the time. But, but when you can see your shepherd, you will lie down and rest. If a coyote comes, you, the shepherd is there. He, he will deal with the coyote so you can rest. If the shepherd was to leave the field, you would, you would be on your feet watching for danger and ready to run. But as long as you can see your shepherd, you will be able to rest. David says, my shepherd makes me lie down. And here's how. The shepherd is with us always. The shepherd is with us always. He was always with David. Even if the worst happens, even if I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will have nothing to fear because my shepherd is with me. And when I know he is with me, I can rest. The third aspect of rest is that the way to find rest is to keep the shepherd in view. The shepherd does not give rest to the sheep by ridding the world of danger. And I want you to see that. You know, he's not saying, man, we're, we're going to get rid of all this danger so you can lay down and rest. No. The wolves are still out there to take you down, but the sheep lie down because they have the shepherd in view. And his presence gives them rest. Here's how you address your fears. I do not face this alone. The shepherd is with me. And my shepherd is the Lord God Almighty. The way to find rest is to keep the shepherd in view. Keep your eyes on the shepherd. Psalm 4 8 says, In peace. I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. What a great verse. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. Psalm 4 8. There's more to the Christian life than just rest. He, he makes me lie down because I need to rest. But we rest in order that we may have strength to follow Him on the right path. The natural order would be that 
you walk the right path and you rest in the meadow. But notice that here, it's, it's the other way around. You rest in the meadow so that you'll be able to walk the right path. That brings me to the third attribute, is the fact that the shepherd restores us. Verse 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And so He restores our soul and He leads us in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. You know, one of the most interesting uh, part of, of a path is that a path is only a path because somebody has gone before you and made a path. A path just doesn't happen naturally. Somebody has to actually go before you, walk the path, tamp down all the grass and the weeds and everything that's in front of you. He leads us in paths of righteousness. You see, at some point in your life, you will need each verse of this psalm. But to me, these four words are the most wonderful of all. He restores my soul. They're words of hope. And one thing I want you to see that these words are in the present tense. David is saying, God has restored me many times in the past, and he will restore me many times in the future as well. Why is this so important? Why do we need it? Well, if the shepherd leads the sheep, surely that is all we need, right? I mean, the shepherd leads us, so that's all we need. Why would we ever need restoring? Well, again, this is my opinion. Though the shepherd leads us, we often go astray. And when we go astray, many times we don't know how to find our way back. Why? Because we're sheep. <laughs> we really are sheep. We, we wander off, and believers wander. Here's, here's the problem. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. That's what the scripture tells us. But we don't find it easy to follow the shepherd. Now I'm sure that we all have experienced this contradiction in our own lives. We, we love the Lord, but our hearts wander. Our obedience falters. And our faith often burns low. Believers wander. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one, every one of us, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It was us that put Jesus on the cross. It was our wayward hearts, our unbelief, our lack of faith that eventually brought the people of Jerusalem to a place where they said, kill him, hang him on a cross. And in doing so, he died for each and every one of us. The story that Jesus told about the Good Shepherd, retrieving the sheep who was lost. You remember the, the 99 and there was one lost and so Jesus goes after the sheep that was lost. And it's a story about what the shepherd does for his own sheep. And when he returns with a, a lamb on his shoulders, he says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. A guy by the name of Philip Keller worked for many, many years as a shepherd. And he wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. If you've never uh, read it, I'd encourage you to read it. But he describes a condition in which a sheep becomes cast. 
it, it can happen when the sheep's fleece is long and heavy or when it's pregnant, when it's carrying lambs. And the problem in either case is the weight that the sheep carries. And if a sheep lies down on its side, all is well. But if it rolls onto its back, it will soon be in trouble. It, it cannot right itself. It, it, it can't turn over and it lies there helpless with four feet kicking in the air. And when a sheep is on its back, it cannot restore itself. And Keller says, as it lies there struggling, gases begin to build up in the rumen. And as they expand, they, they tend to retard and cut off blood circulation to the sheep's extremities, the, the body, and especially the legs. And he describes as a shepherd, he would restore how he would restore a cast sheep. He said, I would have to lift her onto her feet. And then straddling the sheep with my legs, he said, I would hold her erect and I would rub her limbs to restore the circulation to her legs. And this often took quite a, a little bit of time. And when the sheep started to walk again, she, she often would just stumble, staggered, and, and collapse in a heap just, you know, once again. But little by little, the sheep would regain its equilibrium. You see, when God restores you, He will do it gently. David says, Your gentleness made me great. That's Psalm 1835. Your gentleness made me great. Now think of the shepherd rubbing the legs of the cast sheep. The, as you watch them, you picture this in your mind, there's patience, there's tenderness, and there's perseverance. And God will do the same thing for each one of us. He will restore us gently. And also, not only will He restore us gently, but He will do it joyfully. Luke 15, 5, the shepherd himself goes after the sheep that has wandered away, puts the sheep, the lamb, on its shoulders, and then He brings it home. How? He brings it home rejoicing. When your faith is faltering and the shepherd finds you, he's not going to, to rebuke you. He's not going to point a finger in, in judgment of you. He comes looking for you. And he has come to restore each and every one of us. And God finds great joy in restoring his own people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That, you see, that, that's the logic of faith. I mean, you may face hard decisions when you don't know the right way, but the Lord is still your shepherd. He will lead you always in the right paths. That's what the job of the Holy Spirit is, to lead and guide us and point us to Jesus. Paths of righteousness for His namesake. And the path may not always be easy, may not always be the easy path, it may not always be the convenient path. I mean, you may be struck down by disease, you may be laid low without strength, but the Lord is still your shepherd. You, you may have enemies who will oppose you and even try to destroy you, but the Lord is your shepherd. Here's another little point. Perverse and foolish, oft I strayed, and yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulders gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. Perverse and foolish, oft I strayed, and yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulders gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. 
the fourth attribute of the shepherd is that the shepherd protectively guards us. Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the English Standard Version of the Bible, it has a footnote that tells us that this phrase, the valley of the shadow of death, can be translated the valley of deep darkness. You see, death is not the only valley that casts a shadow over us. Dying is the last valley. But there are other valleys that we walk through along the way. The dark valley of depression, the dark valley of unemployment, the dark valley of a failed relationship, the dark valley of a serious illness. Every Christian, every Christ follower knows what it is to walk through times of darkness. And when you find yourself in a dark valley, this psalm is for you. However dark that valley may be, you do not need to fear. Why? Because the Lord is with you. No power can snatch you from his hand. He said, Jesus said, if you're in my hand, nothing can take you from my hand. Nothing can separate you from his love. Romans 8 tells us that. The second part of this verse speaks about the comfort that is found in the shepherd's rod and, and the staff. You see, the rod was a, a club carried by the, the shepherd to fend off wild animals that might attack the sheep. And the staff is, a, is the shepherd's crook that he uses to lift up the lambs in his arms. And so the rod and the staff speak of strength and and the love of the Good Shepherd. You see, it, isn't that a more excellent way of seeing the Shepherd of your soul? Everything about his character speaks of or represents a picture of strength and love. Again, God is not some angry taskmaster who waits judgingly to strike you down when you make a mistake or even wander off. The father of the prodigal son is a perfect picture of God's love. A perfect picture of his grace and his mercy toward each of us. 1 John 1.5 John says, This is the message we have heard from him. Who? That we have heard from Jesus. This is the message that we heard from Jesus. And John said, we declare this to each of you. To who? To us. And this is what John said. He repeats Jesus' words and he says, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. There's not even a, a shadow of turning. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. Psalm 118.27 says, God is God. He has bathed us in light. The fifth attribute that I want to share with you is that He perceptively sustains us. Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. David says, you prepare a table before me. Now, I want you to try and take this picture in. So you, you arrive home after a hard day at work. You're tired, jaded. Your, your energy is, is spent. And someone is in the kitchen cooking up a storm. So you say, let me help. But this person says, no, you sit down. Let me prepare this for you. 
you sit down and you, you watch as this person prepares a meal before you. When it is done, you come to the table and as you eat, your strength is renewed. That's the picture of the shepherd. Notice again that this is also in the present tense. This is not something that, that God did a long time ago. It's not even what God does once in a while. It is what God always does for his people. You prepare a table before me. God uses this picture to, to tell you that he will sustain you by giving you strength. And as your body is strengthened by a, a good meal, so you will also be sustained as the Lord himself feeds you, feeds your spirit. But there's something else here that I want you to catch. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You see, David's life was an unrelenting battle. In his early years, he was a shepherd. He was despised by his older brothers. Then later on, he lived as a, a fugitive, hunted by King Saul. He spent 10 years, over 10 years in a cave. And when he became king, he inherited a divided kingdom. There were rival tribes that were just filled with seething resentments, alienated by a, a deep distrust. In the later years, David suffered as his family was torn apart by cycles of abuse and violence and even death. At one point, his own son rebelled and tried to kill him, and David had to flee for his life. How in the world did he keep going? How, how, did, how will you keep going in the light of, of the many, many, many pressures, the burdens, the conflicts, the troubles of your life? How, how do we keep going? God prepared a table for David. He renewed David's strength, even in the presence of his enemies. And what God did for David, he can also do for each one of us. God sustains us by giving us a purpose. He says, you anoint my head with oil. You see, oil was used in the Old Testament to commission certain people for the work that God had called them to do. The prophets, the priests, the kings were all anointed with oil because God had given them a particular assignment. And so if the table speaks of new strength, the oil speaks of new purpose. The other thing is that God sustains us by giving us joy. David said, my cup overflows. The blessings of God to us in Jesus Christ are never rationed out. From the fullness of God's grace, we have received one blessing on top of another. The very fact that we woke up this morning and we were able to go, is a blessing of God in our lives. His grace just keeps coming. It never ends. It never is rationed out. It's never just a trickle-down idea. No, he says it overflows. There is always an abundance of grace. You see, that's what David experienced in his life, throughout his life. He experienced abundant pardon. He experienced plentiful redemption. He says, my cup overflows. The table, the oil, and the cup. The table reminds us that God sustains us by giving strength. The oil 
reminds us that God sustains by giving us purpose. And the cup reminds us that God sustains us by giving us abundant joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength, is what the scripture says. Now, I want you to notice this the word joy, it's not the word happiness. It's not just happy, happy, happy. I'm so happy to be going through all these trials and tribulations and all these troubles in my life. I'm just happy, happy, happy. No. There is joy in the Lord when we trust Him and believe in Him to carry us through the difficult stages of our life. The last attribute that I want to share with you, we got, got here pretty quick, didn't we? I always love to look at your faces when we're in person when I say, you know, I got 10 reasons today I want to talk about. <laughs> Maybe you felt the same way when I said we have six attributes. Well, they're wonderfully beautiful attributes of the shepherd. It is life with the shepherd. And so the last one is this. He passionately loves us. He passionately loves us. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, David says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, when the Lord is your shepherd, his love surrounds you right now, and His love surrounds you forever. And the love of the Good Shepherd is, it's a love that pursues, and it's also a love that welcomes. Let me share with you a little bit about a love that pursues us. There was a, a Scottish shepherd who preached on this verse surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and he said this think of a shepherd walking in front of his sheep the sheep follow him and behind there are two sheep dogs chasing after the stragglers keeping the flock close to the shepherd the good shepherd has two sheep dogs one is called goodness and the other is called mercy. I, I love that picture. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And the good shepherd keeps me close to himself through his goodness and his mercy. And they're always chasing after me. They're always pursuing us. And when you belong to the good shepherd, this will always be true of your life. His goodness and mercy will always pursue you. His love will always pursue you. I love how one pastor said, he, he said it this way, he said, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the need of God's grace. We're never out of reach of God's grace and we're never going to reach a point where we are beyond the need of God's grace in our lives. So here we are in 2022. We're, we're anxious about our world. We're anxious about our country, our families. We're even anxious about ourselves. And really, who knows what the future holds? But of this one thing you can be certain. Whatever the future holds, God's goodness and God's mercy will follow you all the days of your life. It's like the old saying that we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And in our lives, God's goodness and His mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. So it's a love that pursues us, but it's also a love that welcomes us. 
I think that David is, is looking beyond his days in this world and he, he's already said that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and when he looks beyond the days of his life in this world he sees what comes after it's the joy of eternity and the immediate presence of the Lord and he says and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What will that be like? I, I really don't know what heaven looks like other than what the Bible tells us. But the first thing to say is that it will be very different from life in this world. When you dwell in the house of the Lord, faith will be turned into sight. All of the old battles that you fought will be over. All of the old wounds will be healed. And the Bible tells us that God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. That to me alone is worth accepting Christ into our lives certainly into my life. Just the joy of the fact that all the old battles will be over, all the old wounds will be healed, and God will wipe every tear from your eye. You see, we will have the opportunity to actually see Christ in glory. And His kingdom will come. And His promise that death will be defeated will come true. Death, where is uh, victory? Where is your sting? As Paul said. That will be defeated when we see Christ in person. All of the evil of the world will be overthrown and done away with and heaven will come to earth and God will dwell with His people in a world of love where He will make everything new. You see, the, the greatest blessing that any of us can experience in life is to be wholly owned by the Son of God. That we can say with confidence that the Lord is my shepherd. And if when you can say that, when you can look and, at everyone around you and say, the Lord is my shepherd, then you will all say, also be able to say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful, beautiful pictures this morning. The shepherd personally owns us. He purposely leads us. He restores us. And he loves us passionately, perceptively sustains us. And he does all of these things for one reason, because of his love for us. I hope that these words have been an encouragement to you. We're, I'm actually speaking today from uh, Jan and I's office slash studio. This is where she makes all of her jewelry and I, I get a chance to do a few things in the office. And, and so even though we have not been able to be together personally, my heart and my prayer is that these words today have encouraged you. If you got some time today, sit down and pick up your favorite translation of the Bible and read the 23rd Psalm. It's my go-to chapter in the Scripture, especially facing the, all the stuff that we've been through this past week and with COVID and everything else going on. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. As our great friend Larry Glenn says, God loves you and so do I. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much 
for loving us and being with us. I pray your blessings today on everyone in the sound of my voice, whether they're watching us live or even watch the archived message. I pray, Lord, that you will strengthen us and you will encourage us and you will remind us exactly what you have done for us. And you did it because you love us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. God bless y'all. Hope to see you next week in person. And uh, enjoy the snow. See you next week.